In the heart of Boston, Massachusetts, lies a 281-acre wooded parkland area known as Arnold's Arboretum, a beautiful botanical garden and research institution planted in a naturalistic style its serene park walks belie a history before its life as the Arboretum, where dark events in its past stained the ground and transformed a popular picnic spot into an ugly memorial that few wished to visit. Several years later, these events in Boston found themselves tied into a story of a murderer that the contemporary press called the most monstrous and inhuman criminal of modern times, or indeed any time. Though despite their shocking nature, they have somehow become largely forgotten, if not for a bizarre report of a ghost sighting that keeps the link cases alive, sparking the public imagination. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome, I'm Ben and this is Dark Histories Season 7, Episode 14. It's good to be back after a little short summer break there, Uh, It was nice actually to get back on top of a bit of my research and organise a couple of episodes that I sort of half organised and half sort of put on the back burner and just sort of cast off into the dark history's abyss. Um, Yeah, so it was nice to sort of get those back sorted out and and ready to go and and things like that. I'm glad everyone seemed to enjoy the Mr. James sort of stand-in episode. Uh, Had quite a lot of emails about that. Everyone seemed to actually really enjoy it, which was great. Uh, except for I did get a few emails saying, by the way, you have actually read a school story before, which <laughs> I completely forgotten about. Uh, apparently, I read it um, for one of the Christmas uh, campfires, which I knew that I'd read um, uh, M.R. James' story for the Christmas campfire before. But I thought it was the stalls of Barchester Cathedral, but apparently not. Um, apparently, it was a school story. But anyway, I'm sure, you know, well, hopefully, I like to think that I get slightly better on the microphone every episode that comes out. So hopefully I could read it slightly better than last time. I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. This week's episode is quite a long one. because It was a, a very obscure story, actually, um, and almost zero written about it. Uncovering everything has managed to sort of draw it into quite a long story. So let's get on. This episode is called... The Bussies Woods Ghost Mystery and the Murders of Franklin B. Evans A few miles south of downtown Boston, Massachusetts, the area of the city, known as Jamaica Plain, is home to a large, sprawling public park of Arnold's Arboretum. America's first public arboretum, it's been managed by Harvard University for over 140 years and it serves as both a public area of natural beauty and a site for scientific and horticultural research whose paths wind through hills and valleys featuring dense woodland and elevated views over the Boston skyline and the blue hills behind. Prior to its life as the Harvard Arboretum, the area around Jamaica Plain consisted of a large wooded parkland divided predominantly by two large estates, that of Benjamin Bussey, a successful shipping and trading merchant with Europe, who had used his wealth to consolidate vast swathes of farmland that he had acquired throughout his life in Boston. Known locally as Bussey's Hill and Bussey's Woods, the merchant opened his land to the public, inviting them to walk and picnics throughout the hills and woods, enjoying the abundance of nature that flourished in the green oasis. Following his death in 1842, the estate was bequeathed to Harvard University, who eventually combined it with the second large estate of the area 30 years later, in 1872, when the Boston-based whaling merchant James Arnold passed away, handing his own land over to the care of Harvard University, including a sum of money in trust that was to be used by the university to set up the arboretum that would go on to bear his name. Benjamin Bussey bought the majority of his Jamaica Plain estate in 1806, which he used to develop his interest in scientific farming and ornamental gardening. He also planted large areas of fresh woodland, after the area had been previously cleared in order to free up ground for grazing animals and to supply the city with firewood. By 1841, when Bussey opened the estate to the public, the woods had developed into a thriving parkland of beautiful natural splendour. Bussey died a year later, but with his estate safely entrusted, the land continued to exist as a place for the public to enjoy, which they did in their thousands, especially at the weekends when the path to the top of Bussey's Hill would be filled by couples, families and children, all out to enjoy the solitude of the woods, away from the city, in what was described by one local as a sylvan asylum of perfect repose. 
whilst the solitude and dense woodland created the perfect environment for a romantic afternoon away from the tight rows of brick housing, the din of industry and the clatter of the horse-drawn carts that characterised Boston, it also created the perfect environment for the darker events that transpired in the summer of 1865, when the beautiful estates of Jamaica Plain took on a whole different association, as the scene of what the New York Times called one of the most terrible and revolting crimes to have occurred in New England. Massachusetts in June of 1865 was living through an unusually hot spell for the time of year. As temperatures rose in downtown Boston, people were busy making arrangements for the return of the local military batteries after the end of the Civil War, which had wrapped up weeks earlier. The distant melodies pinging through the warm, still air from the brass band and drum corps hovered over the streets as they clattered with the hooves of horses, pulling carts full of goods and streetcars full of people around the city. On Monday the 12th of June, just after 11am, 14-year-old Isabella Joyce was making her way across the city with her younger brother, 12-year-old John. They lived with their mother, a widowed seamstress, but since she had left town for work for three days, they had been staying with their grandmother in a three-storey, semi-detached red-brick terrace building on the corner of Newland and Concord Street on the southern tip of downtown Boston. Their mother had gone away that morning, and so when John suggested to Isabella that they head over to Mays Woods, it was to their aunt that they had to promise that they would return before John's afternoon school session at 2pm. With ten cents each in their pockets, the two children headed out into the sun. However, at some point, they made an adjustment to their plans, and instead of heading towards Mays Woods, they headed south aboard the horse car towards Bussey's Woods instead. When John didn't return in time for school that afternoon as promised, there was some concern, but it wasn't until the following day that their absence was reported to the West Roxbury Police by the Joyce children's grandma. Deputy Marshal Joseph Hubbard conducted a search for the children, enlisting the aid of seven other officers, but no sign of them was found for the rest of the week, though a pair of witnesses did give vaguely related statements to the police that they had seen two children walking south towards the neighbourhood of Dorchester on the day of their disappearance. It was around 1pm on Sunday the 19th of June when two Boston merchants, John Jameson and John Santel, were out walking through Bussey's woods when they stumbled across the body of a young girl lying in a small rocky opening 30 feet from the maintained path, on a ground of shattered flint. A sapling on the western boundary lay snapped and broken, suggesting a struggle of some kind had occurred. The two merchants found the landowner, Mr Motley, who notified police and the coroner, Ira Allen, who was one of the first officials to arrive on the scene, alongside Dr Arnold. The body of the young girl was in poor shape, though from the clothes, a purple check silk dress and straw hat, it was quickly confirmed to be the body of Isabella Joyce. A wreath lay twisted around the brim of the hat, cast aside from the body. The press noted the following day, with some outrage, that, from the clothing having been removed from her lower half, she had been sexually assaulted at the time of the attack, with the New York Daily Herald calling it one of the most brutal and cold-blooded murders ever committed. After Mrs Joyce was contacted, the police were informed that John was still missing, and a new search of the woods was conducted by the officials and a group from the community who had filtered up to the site after news of the find had crept out to the houses in the local area. Six and a half hours later, around 7.30pm, two locals, Christopher Drew and Fred Seymour, found the body of John Joyce in a dense shrubbery next to a small stream passing beneath a small stone bridge a quarter of a mile away from the body of Isabella. One of the most confusing elements for the officials was that neither body had been found by the numerous day-trippers who had been passing by both scenes just feet away, and neither had appeared to have had any attempts to disguise their presence. Unfortunately, the crime scenes led to few other leads for the investigation, a matter that was not helped by the tourists that flocked to the scene in the days following the press reports of the body's discovery. Some of the locals estimated that over a thousand visitors per day swarmed over the ground, trampling on any evidence that may have been left behind by the killer. It was a full week between the discovery of the bodies and the start of the inquest. However, despite the time, there was little in the way of leads to put to the coroner and jury, and the majority of the first day was given to discussing the evidence supporting the identification of both children. 
Dr. Joseph Stedman, who'd carried out autopsies on both bodies, gave the most enlightening evidence when he described the severity of the wounds on both Isabella and John. On examination, discovered various wounds in the region of the breast, lungs and heart, 11 in all. One of the wounds, just above the left breast, reaching to the heart, was of itself sufficient to cause instant death. Should judge that the wounds were inflicted while the person was lying down. Have no doubt that death was caused by injuries received from some sharp cutting instrument. Was called to examine the body of the boy the same evening. Discovered eight wounds in the back, four of which entered on the right of the spinal column, passing completely through the body, and two of which passed through the heart, either of which would have caused instant death. Despite earlier reports that Isabella's right hand had been mutilated and her mouth stuffed with grass, Dr. Stedman told the inquest that aside from the horrific stab wounds in both bodies' torsos, there were no other signs of violence on either bodies, which, along with the exaggerated wound counts being reported in the papers, highlighted the level of hysteria and sensationalism that began to surround the case. The straight-talking doctor went on to confirm that he agreed with the police in that he believed also that there was only a single killer and that he thought the boy had been stabbed in the back whilst trying to run away, the killer chasing him down in order to conceal the murder of Isabella. Given that the weapon was long enough to pierce entirely through the boy's body, a knife with a blade of minimum 10 inches was suggested as the murder weapon, though nothing was uncovered from the scene. Following the medical evidence, the inquest was adjourned on the basis that there was little more for anyone to speak about until the police had had more time to come up with a suspect, or at least some form of clue as to who the killer could have been. With the inquest breathing heavily over their shoulders, the police launched into the investigation, arresting several suspects, though many were tenuous at best. For the first two weeks, police arrested a handful of men from the local area that were generally seen as outsiders, men who had let their commitment to church on Sunday slip or that had fallen into poverty for one reason or another. Rumours flew through the streets, and one particularly amusing being the description of the supposed killer who unnamed witnesses had claimed to have seen stalking two children through the woods. Naturally, he had been a foreign-looking, dark-skinned man with a twisted moustache and an evil and fierce facial expression. As if this report could have been any more ridiculous, the witnesses claimed that they saw the stalker on the day after the murders took place, but it didn't stop the description circulating through the streets nonetheless. Thomas Ainsley, the Joyce family's landlord, a house painter from Boston, was questioned as a suspect for a short time, but the only link he had to the crime was his familiarity with the victims, and the line was quickly dropped. Finally, the police made an arrest following a lead that they believed had the legs to have been something a little more solid. The chief of police had received a tip-off about a man named John Stewart a few days following the discovery of the bodies, and then, in the weeks following, another two people came forward, fingering the same man, with one suggesting that whilst they were out drinking one night, Stewart had boasted to him that he was the murderer. Quickly, the police tracked down Stewart and his relatives, leading to detectives Heath and Jones visiting his aunt's house in Boston, where they discovered that the 22-year-old Irish-born migrant was a very recently enlisted soldier in the 20th Regular Infantry, having signed up just four days after the murder and was currently stationed at Fort Independence on Castle Island, Boston Harbour. Even more interestingly, his aunt, Mrs Leonard, told them that on the evening of the murder, he had shown up at a mutual acquaintances of theirs, Winifred O'Connell, at around 6.30pm, drunk and asking for supper, with bloodied hands and torn bloodstained clothing. Unfortunately, his aunt had not seen him since that night and had no idea of his whereabouts. The police had no more luck when they paid a visit to Fort Independence, but couldn't pin down any soldiers that matched the description that they had been given of Stuart. Their perseverance paid off a few days later, however, when they returned on Saturday the 8th of July with a new description and a young man that claimed to know Stuart, who quickly helped them find their man. With a warrant for his arrest already issued by Justice Worthington, Stuart was taken to a prison cell to await questioning. The police had already noted, with some excitement, the healing cuts on his hands and face that his aunt had previously mentioned. On his way to the station, he told the police that he could provide a thorough alibi, saying that he could tell you all about where I was that night, and when asked what night he was referring to, he told them the night of the murder. The 
Despite the fact that the murder was huge news and most people in the town knew almost as much as the police thanks to rampant reporting, the police saw this as a sign that Stuart was an important suspect. The days following his arrest didn't get any brighter for Stuart either when police found out that he was something of a serial deserter, having previously fled from Camp Cadwallader in Philadelphia under his own name and several other regiments over as many years under several different names. It was also unearthed that he had given a confession to a Catholic priest in the days following the murder, but the details were not handed over to the police in accordance with the church's duty of absolute confidentiality. Outside of the officials, the paper and the public were torn on his guilt, and while some suggested that there was a host of circumstantial evidence that was as yet unpublished, tying him to the crime, others noted that his appearance was not what they expected of such a cold killer, printing that he hardly had the appearance of being a wretch sufficiently hardened to be capable of committing the brutal crime with which he is charged. As it turned out, the sceptics had it right, which was confirmed a few days later after Stuart's clothing came back from the lab with negative results, confirming his alibi that, rather than stalking children through the woods, he was simply a fan of getting drunk and brawling in bars. On the night of the murder, before he had stumbled into his aunt's house, He had gotten into a fight in a local bar that ended with him putting his hand through a window, smashing the glass and slicing his hand. Much to the official's disappointment, he was discharged just in time for the resumption of the inquest, where much of Stuart's alibi was confirmed publicly by witnesses who had seen him during the days following the murder, where he appeared to be drinking and sleeping rough after his desertion from Fort Independence. It was, otherwise, a rather difficult day for the police who watched as witnesses gave vague testimonies of hearing screaming in the distance on the day of the murders, or that they believed that they possibly saw men walk through the woods that weekend, but were unable to furnish any coherent or detailed descriptions. The inquest concluded with the jury stating that both of the Joyce children were murdered, dead from the wounds inflicted by some sharp instrument in the hands of some person or persons to the jury unknown. Meanwhile, With the investigation floundering, a spiritualist circle, which included Mrs Joyce, the murdered children's mother, forwarded the minutes to a series of table sittings that they had been undertaking to the police, within which they professed to have been in contact with both Isabella Joyce and her deceased father, Stephen Joyce. Utilising automatic writing, the spirits of both had detailed a description of the killer to the circle. Very probably, having been influenced by the stories in the papers of Stuart, The spirits outlined the murderer as an Irish soldier with bloody hands wearing blue clothing. Isabella's spirit described the day of the murder in detail, explaining how the man had followed them into the woods and stalked them for some time before leaping out and killing her and her brother. Unfortunately, the circle's information was somewhat undermined by the detail that Stephen Joyce had provided, prophesying that the police would catch the killer on the 5th of July, which had, perhaps unsurprisingly, passed by without any arrests at all. In the weeks following the inquest, the investigation stalled entirely. With no leads to go on, a reward totalling $5,500 was published in all the local papers, $1,000 coming from the Boston Mayor's office, with the other 4500 raised by a group of wealthy Boston merchants and a subscription for local citizens. If the spiritualist circle's minutes had been a strange detail to the investigation, It was, in conjunction with the reward, testimony to how desperate things had gotten. The Joyce children's murder had caused a sensation and people were shocked and appalled by the brutal killings. They were also entranced by it and it dominated local life, with the police feeling the responsibility of capturing the killer weighing heavy on their shoulders. It had been three weeks since the discovery of the bodies and there was almost zero progress in the investigation. It was around this time that a new lead came in that made the spiritualist seances look positively rational in comparison. A lodger in one of the manor houses situated on the outskirts of Bussey's Woods, Henry Johnson Brent, had been involved some way or another with the murder investigation from the very first day, after he had been amongst the first to discover the fate of the Joyce children when he had heard the shouts of the officials coming from the woods while sitting on his porch smoking on the evening of their discovery. Two weeks later, he'd even found himself a suspect, simply for living in the immediate area, though the police did little in the way of pursuit, other than a few cursory checks into his background. 
Johnson Brent had spent much of his spare time wandering the woods and painting the landscapes that he saw there, and after the killings he continued his walks through the area, though his enthusiasm for the natural beauty took a fairly severe hit with the black mark of the murders hanging over the trees. Most nights he went out for an evening stroll with the master of the manor's dogs, both of which were named Jack. One, a bulldog with a sweet and uncommon Christian disposition, whilst the other, a mastiff, who was much more of a fighter, or, as Henry put it, a cat warrior. It was around 8.30pm when Henry was out walking the dogs through the long meadow that overlooked Bussy's woods. The tall trees of Motley's wood on the left side cast long shadows across the open field, lined with a low stone wall that wound all the way down to the location where Isabella Joyce's body had been found three weeks prior. As he walked through the dim light of dusk, Henry began to feel that things were slightly off kilter. The dogs had drawn in close to him, walking hesitantly by his side, and then, in the distance, he spotted the outline of a character leaning over the wall. Thinking it could possibly have been the master of the manor on his way home from his business in the city, he called out into the still summer air, but no reply came. The shadowy figure climbed the wall and began crossing the field, ignoring him completely. It was only after his words were ringing across the open air when Henry realised that if it was the master, the dogs would have been acting quite the opposite, charging him down with all the excitement that they usually reserved for their owner, rather than cowering behind, reluctant to move forward, almost as much as Henry. Whilst I stood perfectly motionless, waiting for some recognition of my appeal, the figure advanced slowly in a direct line from the wall, leaving the shadow and stopped before me, and not twenty feet away from me. I saw at once that it was somebody that I had never seen before. Utilising all the courage that he could muster, Henry called out once more, telling the figure to stop and threatening him with a non-existent pistol, the appeal springing from his mouth before he had thought to conjure it. The dogs drew in closer as the trio watched the figure begin to walk casually across the field in front of them. The dogs were evidently frightened, and by the casual glance that I gave them, induced to do so by the sensation of their touch, I saw that they were looking with every symptom of terror at the figure that stood so near us without emotion. And the figure, it never once turned its head directly toward me, but seemed to fix its look eastward where the pine trees broke the clear horizon on the murder hill. This inert pose was preserved, but for a moment, for as quick as the flash of gunpowder, it wheeled as upon a pivot, and, making one movement, as of a man commencing to step out toward the wall, was gone. The figure, which Henry by now had convinced himself was that of a ghost, had avoided his gaze and not allowed him to get a proper look, but he thought he saw enough to give half a description. Can I describe this figure, you will ask? And my reply is that I can, but not exactly in such a way as to satisfy the chief's business-like interrogatory. It looked like painted air to begin with. An artist sitting by my side and following my ideas might render it to the life or death. But he would have to blend his matter-of-fact pencil with the vague vehicles of spiritualistic imagination. In the first place, there was no elaborate toilet. Indeed, I could not make out the fashion of the garment, taking it for granted that it was draped in the usual costume, being too absorbed by the complex and somewhat agitated train of thought which, commencing with the assumption that it was my friend, and which was suddenly relinquished, leaving me exposed to the rapid transitions of intellectual deductions so singularly called into action, and so totally at variance with my habitual mental or nervous equanimity. I felt as a drowning man might feel who, admitting the fact that the water has got the master of him, lets the primary incident take care of itself, and looks only to some object by whose aid he may relieve himself from the desperate catastrophe. I was occupied more in the effort to recognise the human being in the figure that was before me than in making a tailor's analysis of his apparel. One thing was evident. He looked dark grey from head to foot. Body he had, and legs, and arms, and a head. But the face I could not distinctly see as he turned it from me. But there was an outline such as can be traced in shadows thrown by a dim lamp upon a rough plastered wall and that is all I can say about it. After the figure spontaneously vanished, Henry collected his senses and made quickly for the warm light of his lodgings, 
where he calmed down and spent ten minutes collecting his thoughts. As his fear subsided, his curiosity took over, and so, with a newfound determination, he headed back out into the woods with Jack and Jack, the trusty dogs, who followed along, albeit somewhat reluctantly, until they were back onto the same spot in the field looking down towards the murder scene. I stood still as a living man can stand and fixed my eyes upon the wall where the figure had first appeared, but all was moveless and silent. The old wall and the shadows looked as they did before. I turned quick as thought and tried to surprise any faint glimpse of anything that might have come to the spot where the apparition had stopped in the interval of my withdrawn attention. But there was nothing but the short grass backed by the dark wood where the deeds of blood had been perpetrated. I even looked to see if anything was lying down to avoid my scrutiny, walked over to the spot and then, in a straight line to the wall, supposing it was possible I might find some trace of a presence, I found nothing. Feeling somewhat braver than he had been earlier that evening, he returned home once more and dropped off the two dogs, collected his pistol and then marched back out, this time continuing down through the field, following the low stone wall to the scene of Isabella's murder, hoping to find something that might make sense of everything that he had experienced. Not a sound, but the crackling of dead branches under my feet in the pathway. Sounds that I felt might send the notice of my approach to whatever was waiting for me by the cross and the immortel on the murder rock. Though the broken branches were sentinelling my advent, I kept on, with a cold shiver now and then quivering all over me, but never for a moment going deeper than the skin. Brain and heart, as yet, were true to their purpose of folly that seemed like madness to me then. It did not take me long to reach the objective point of my journey. The woods had always looked different in the daytime, before the murders. Now, as he paced around the crime scene, the weird-looking trees, as he put it, twisted hither and thither around him, awaking a profound sense of dread and fear. I placed myself exactly on the blood-stained spot. I looked around with the certainty of being confronted by the apparition whose existence I was there to determine. Now, thought I, is the opportunity... This is the place for a revelation. What other man will ever come again with so foolhardy a brain and give the witnesses or the victim a chance so appropriate and so melodramatic? If anyone does venture upon the trial to a scene so fresh with gory associations, from my soul I pity him and would blame him. But this species of curiosity is not generally diffused throughout society. But I was there and awaited whatever issue might transpire. I was doubtless in a sublimated condition of rapport, as the mediumistic philosophers term it, a human instrument of a thousand strings that the feeblest ghost might play upon with ever so withered a hand. But none came to inform or frighten me, and not a sound other than the low clicking of the wood insects broke the magic ring of silence that closed in with such profundity of pathos this terrible situation. To attempt to go away, I found required more nerve than to get there, for now I must turn my back and place myself in the traditional position in which cowardice is said to place its victims. But, with the cold creepings renewed with double energy, I turned and walked with an excited composure away from the spot, down the hill, through the gateway that opens eastward into the Dedham Road, and then, with half a dozen sighs of relief, straight home. Once he was back in the warmth of his home once more, Henry considered what everything could possibly have meant. Familiar with the spiritualist circle's meetings, where they had professed to have had contact with the Joyce children's father, Stephen Joyce, he considered for a moment that the figure he had seen may well have been Stephen's spirit. Henry reported this vision to the police, but as one might expect, nothing came of it. Instead, Henry took it upon himself to write about his experiences, publishing it in a pamphlet which he titled was it a ghost, the murders in Bussey's Woods, an extraordinary narrative, hoping to keep the murders and the investigation in the public eye? Despite his best efforts, though, the case soon fell cold and even reports of ghosts walking through the fields could do little to keep it alive, and eventually the inevitable fell down upon it. A year after the murders, there was a brief renewal of interest when a convict locked up in Charleston State Prison 
named Scratch Gravel boasted of having been the killer to his cellmate. But when police checked his movements and uncovered the fact that he couldn't possibly have been in Boston, nor anywhere in Massachusetts at all at the time of the murder, Scratch Gravel was chalked up as being nothing more than a blustering braggart, and the entire affair fell into the background once more, leaving the conclusion a mystery and the killer a free man. At least for another seven years. Franklin B. Evans was born in a small town named Stratford, nestled along the southeastern border of New Hampshire in 1807. At the turn of the century, Stratford stood with a population just short of 2,000 souls and was, as its small population might suggest, a rural, peaceful town surrounded by green rolling hills, low mountains and a thick forest. A somewhat difficult child without much interest in school, Evans was a younger teenager when he hit the road and took off away from his quiet, peaceful and isolating hometown, choosing instead to embark on what would turn out to be a somewhat chaotic life, bouncing from place to place. Travelling throughout New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine and at times crossing the northern border into Canada, he worked wherever he found a vacancy and frequently fudged his credentials in order to secure employment. Several times he came to have studied medicine in Manchester under a Dr Hansen and practised as a botanic physician, prescribing all manner of folk remedies to those foolish enough to trust his judgement of the local flora. When medicine grew old, he worked as a showman, giving exhibitions using both electrical batteries and magic lanterns, and when keeping on the right side of the law became too much of a chore, he dabbled in counterfeit cash and fraud. Much like his home and work life, his romantic affairs were relatively transient, though his first marriage to a Stratford woman named Hannah Peavy did foster a degree of stability, with the couple producing two children, a son and a daughter, before Hannah passed away, signalling a return to the vagabond life for Henry. He married twice more, but both unions proved to be less successful, and neither lasted long enough for Henry to settle down again. By the 1860s, he was routinely passing himself off as a second Adventist preacher, a yarn that he somewhat successfully spun until he was caught mixing with sex workers and hanging out in pipe smoking parlours. In the summer of 1870, he turned to fraud once again. Whilst living in the house of his brother-in-law in Derry, he took out a general accident policy, naming his brother as the beneficiary with the Boston-based Travellers Insurance Company for the sum of $1,500. Just three weeks later, Evans went down to the beach, dumped a pile of his old clothes, ensuring to leave papers in the pockets tying them to himself, and disappeared into the wilderness of Vermont in order to lie low. When no body was found in the sea, however, the insurance company got suspicious and further investigated Evans' movements around the days of his supposed drowning, and uncovered a string of lies and frauds that led the company to rule the whole affair a fraud and deny the insurance claim. In the spring of 1871, at the age of 64, and with his wandering days withering on the limb, he took lodgings at the home of his sister, Deborah Day, who lived in Northwood, New Hampshire, with her husband, Sylvester Day, their widowed daughter, Susanna Lovering, and Susanna's 14-year-old daughter, Georgiana Georgie Lovering. Whilst living with his family, he worked as a farmhand, taking on temporary work around the various local farms, and generally getting on peacefully. The Day farmhouse backed onto a 2,000-acre tract of woodland where Evans spent a fair amount of time hunting partridge with snare traps, a pastime that he introduced to Georgie, who found the birds fascinating. On the evening of Thursday the 24th of October, 1872, Evans took Georgie aside and asked her for a favour. He had made plans to work at the neighbouring farm of Daniel Hill the following day, and so he asked Georgie if she would go into the woods for him in order to check the traps for any birds. Somewhat hesitant to go alone, finding the woods to be a scary place by herself, she eventually acquiesced, agreeing to head out briefly after her morning chores. The morning of Friday the 25th of October was a beautiful sunny day. The crisp autumn air whipped gently across the fields, swaying the fiery trees of the woods in a, in a picturesque autumnal morning. Evans finished his breakfast and then set off to the hill farm, whilst Georgie got on with her daily domestic tasks, wrapping up at 9am when she put on her hat and shawl and bid farewell to her mother and grandmother and made her way out to the forest to check the snare traps. It was around an hour later when Mrs Lovering began looking for Georgie, 
She needed the girl to go into the village for her, but Georgie still hadn't returned from the woods. Usually, a trip to the snare traps with Evans would have taken her about 30 to 45 minutes, so she asked her father, Mr Day, if he would go out into the field and call for her. Mr Day walked out into the pasture, then continued along to the path into the woods, calling out to Georgie a few times, but getting no response. Soon enough, he found himself deep into the trees and so stopped and called her name three times. Silence returned, and finally, Mr Day turned on his heels and headed back to the farmhouse alone. Upon his return, Mrs Lovering became somewhat anxious concerning her daughter's fate. The two headed back out into the woods together, and when Mrs Lovering found Georgie's shawl lying on the ground, her fears burst out and she hurried back to the farmhouse, and together with Mr Day, rounded up several of the neighbours to carry out a more thorough search for her daughter. For several hours, they searched around the woods, looking for any sign of Georgie, but nothing came, at least until the afternoon, when a neighbouring farmer, James Pender, found a broken comb with a few strands of hair threaded through the teeth. Mrs Lovering confirmed that it had been Georgie's and that she had left home that morning with it in her hair. Word was sent to the village of the missing girl, and with some panic, a search party was hustled together that some estimated to have consisted of more than a hundred locals who eagerly spread out into the surrounding woods and countryside. With such a task force, it didn't take long for more bad news to unravel, when obvious signs of a struggle were uncovered nearby the location where Georgie's shawl had been found earlier that morning. Broken branches, scattered leaves and drag marks in the mud all signalled the worst, but no other signs of Georgie were uncovered for the remainder of the day. Sheriff Henry Drew spearheaded the investigation looking for the missing girl and he questioned the local residents. It didn't take too long for suspicion to fall onto Franklin Evans. James Pender, the young farmer who had discovered Georgie's comb, also told the sheriff of how he had seen Evans stalking off into the woods on Friday morning around the time that Georgie had disappeared. And when Daniel Hill confirmed that he had made no plans with Evans for him to work on his farm that day, and in fact, he hadn't seen him for more than a week. Drew visited the old man at the Day's farmhouse on Saturday evening and arrested him under suspicion of murder. Evans remained calm the entire time that he was escorted to Sheriff Drew's house in Stafford, though he did insist several times that he knew nothing about Georgie's whereabouts. Upon their arrival, Evans's pockets were searched, where the sheriff found a wallet, a small sum of cash, some obscene books, a bottle of liquor and a blood-stained, bone-handled knife with two blades that the sheriff described as keen as a razor. The following day, Evans was taken to court for his arraignment before Justice Ira B. Holt. Sheriff Drew remained close to Evans the whole journey and spent the time trying to soften him up, explaining to him that no harm would come of him if he were to confess and promising to do his best to protect him, even going so far as to suggest that he could help him to escape over the Canadian border. But still, Evans would not confess, insisting that as far as he knew, the girl was still alive. Meanwhile, the hunt for Georgie continued, as more and more locals chipped in to help search as the news spread, even as the weather turned towards a drowning storm. By Sunday, over 250 residents were said to have joined the party. But still, no sign of the lost girl was uncovered, until it was called off on Tuesday evening, thanks to a new lead that Sheriff Drew had coerced from Evans. The sheriff, who had been working on Evans for the whole weekend, had finally got his confession on Tuesday afternoon. Evans had told him that he hadn't been lying and that the girl really was still alive. He had, however, had a hand in her disappearance after he had arranged with a farmer named Webster, who he said lived about 35 miles south in the town of Kingston, to meet with her in the woods on Friday morning and carry her away to make her his wife. Evans told Drew that he had furnished her with $11 for the journey and also supplied her with some fancy clothing, which she had changed into in the woods in order to keep the whole thing secret from her family, discarding her old clothes, which were later found during the search. The story seemed plausible enough and Drew thought Evans genuine, so he called off the search and the following day took the prisoner to Kingston to to search for the kidnapping farmer or the eloping young girl. Asking around, no Webster could be found in the town and when Drew became suspicious, Evans suggested that maybe he had misheard the man, and perhaps it was Kensington that he had said, six miles to the east of Kingston. With a certain degree of hesitation, Drew packed up the search, and the two men headed out to Kensington the following day. But once more, 
no man was found. When Drew questioned Evans, he tried to change his story again. But Drew had had enough. Realising he was being taken on a wild goose chase, he hauled Evans, who was said to have really enjoyed the trip, back to Stafford, arriving on Friday evening, where the prisoner dined with him and his wife, eating a hearty supper and behaving glibly. That evening, Drew resolved to pressure Evans once more, and further push for a confession. In an event that was reported in a highly dramatic fashion, the two men sat in the sheriff's house, staring eye to eye. In the hearing of no persons but us two and the great being above, I ask you the question, is the body of the girl cold in death? The eyes of the two men were fastened on each other, neither made the slightest movement, and not a sound was heard except the measured tick of the clock, and perhaps their own partially suppressed breathing. For some seconds, it seemed doubtful who would relax first. But Evans, evidently becoming unnerved under the calm, searching gaze of the officer, suddenly turned pale. His hands trembled, and from his quivering lips came the words, It is, Mr. Drew. I have done wrong. However the scene really went down, the outcome was the same. Evans confessed to murder to Sheriff Drew and agreed to take him to the body. By the time that they reached the woods, a three-mile trek from the sheriff's house, it was approaching midnight and Drew had to force Evans to lead him through the trees under the dim light of a lantern. The darkness was intense and as they went along nothing was audible save the rustling of the leaves under their feet and the wind moaning dismally through the trees. They passed the spot where the apron was found and got over the fence where the broken comb was discovered but not a word escaped the lips of either man. Then they entered the swamp where stones, fallen trees and treacherous bog holes made locomotion very difficult. They often went into the mud and both of them fell several times. Suddenly, Evans stopped and seemed bewildered, said he had lost the trail and must go back to the fence and start again. Conflicting thoughts then came into the sheriff's mind, but he did not waver for a moment. He motioned with the lantern and both went back over the tolsome way to the brush fence. Evans looked around carefully and without uttering a word, again started into the swamp. Once more, they were threading their way through the difficult morass. The obstructions were even more formidable than before. At length, wet and bruised, they reached a bleaker spot than they had heretofore seen. It was a hollow filled with rocks, fallen trees and other debris. One very large tree had fallen and its roots were so embedded in the soil that they tore up the earth for a considerable space. Close to the ground, under the shivering mass of fibres and earth, Evans pointed his finger and said, There. Sheriff Drew pulled a mass of leaves away on the ground, around the roots of a fallen tree, uncovering the pale body of Georgie Lovering. Given the late hour and the remote location, it took nearly two hours for the officials to gather in the swamp in order to investigate the grim find. Judge John G. Mead, Dr. Caleb Hansen, and two selectmen from the town government all helped to move the body to a safe spot in the forest. A pair of light abrasions on her face gave way to bruising around her neck that made it clear for the doctor that Georgie had been strangled, whilst her clothing pulled up around her torso suggested that she had been sexually assaulted. The girl's torso had been viciously mutilated with a sharp instrument and portions of her vagina had been crudely removed. After the group had all returned to the village, Drew successfully talked Evans into taking him over to the spot where he had hidden the mutilated remains of Georgie, and the two men made their way over to Sherborne's Mill, a mile from the Day farmhouse, where Evans lifted a large rock, uncovering the macabre package. Meanwhile, the body of Georgie was taken to Mr Mead's general store, where the inquest was due to be held. It was 4.30am by the time that they had found their way out of the woods, and so the body was left until morning giving the officials a short period of rest before the inquest was underway. The next morning, the town woke up to the news that Evans had confessed and the long-missing girl had been discovered overnight. Throughout that morning, most of the village filed past Georgie's body, while Sheriff Drew quietly secreted Evans away to his house in Stafford, fearing for his safety as the mob began gathering by the town hall. The inquest, held later that day, found Georgie's cause of death to be strangulation at the hands of Evans, even after Evans was moved to a proper prison cell in Exeter, no visitors were permitted, in the fear that they might attempt to harm him. Such was the depths of the public opinion of the old man. Perhaps beginning to realise the seriousness of his situation, especially after every attorney contacted refused to represent him, Evans quickly backtracked on his confession 
at the same time confessing his own gullibility, saying that he had only taken the sheriff to the body under the assumption that he would be set free, helped travel to Canada and given half of the reward money offered for information on the discovery of Georgie's whereabouts after doing so. Instead, he said that an unnamed man had killed the girl by the time that he had reached the woods and that he had merely helped him to hide the body. I am not guilty of the murder, but knew where the body was put. When I got to the woods, he had killed her, said he had outraged her, and then choked her to death. He wanted me to help him conceal the body, and said he would give me a handsome present. We then lugged her a half or three quarters of a mile. I took her by the head, and he by the feet and legs. For whatever reason, Evans told officials that he did not wish to give the killer's name, and did his best to act bereaved, complaining that the police had not allowed him to attend Georgie's funeral. It wasn't the most convincing act, especially after he had proven himself capable of lying with the Kingston debacle. Sheriff Drew remained close to Evans, acting as his go-between, speaking on behalf of the prisoner to the press and the outside world, and constant chaperone when receiving visitors. Over the coming weeks, the hatred felt towards him would only grow as more allegations filtered out to the public, concerning more than the murder of Georgie Lovering. With the public, press and police hard against him, Franklin B. Evans saw his name fly across the United States and even travel across the ocean as his arrest was reported in popular British newspapers like the Illustrated Police News. Just as reports of the murder of Georgie began falling off the main pages, a new revelation came about, catapulting the story of his arrest and incarceration back into the spotlight. Whilst he was under the care of Sheriff Drew, Drew began questioning him as to his whereabouts during the last 15 years, hoping to establish a more concrete background for the trial. During this questioning, he discovered that evidence had passed through Roxbury in Boston for about a week during 1865. Having the dim recollection of a pair of child murders nearby to Roxbury around the same period that resembled Georgie's murder in its brutality, the sheriff began pushing Evans on the particulars, asking him where he had lived at the time of the murders and what he thought about the details. Earlier that morning, two men had come to ogle at Evans in his cell out of curiosity, and as evidence of his increasingly nervous disposition, Evans had began panicking, asking the sheriff if the men had come from Boston in order to question him about the Joyce murders. After the men had left, he approached the sheriff with a look of terror in his eyes. Mr Drew, they are after me, he told the sheriff. You won't let them have me, will you? Trying to reassure Evans, the sheriff told him that he would not let them have him, but pushing for answers again, he inquired as to why he was so concerned. In reply, Evans told him, I was right there, and if you let them have me, I cannot get out of it. I know I shall have to be hung. In a later conversation between the two men, Evans described the Joyce murders further, saying that Isabella had made much ado more than the boy, and that she had been raped before her murder, and that they were both stabbed several times. He also described the house where the children had lived in Boston, correcting the sheriff on its location. Despite Evans alluding to knowing a deal more about the Joyce children murder than he should do, he continued to claim that he was not guilty for any murders at all, a position he maintained right up until his trial, which kicked off at 2pm on February 3rd, 1873, in the Exeter Town Hall, in front of Judge Doe and Ladd. The indictment posited that Evans did choke and strangle, throw down upon the ground, kick, beat and bruise, and with a knife did indecently and terribly mutilate the body of his victim, each and all unto her death. The prosecution was headed up by the Attorney General, Lewis Clark, a well-respected attorney who was celebrating his 21st year as a member of the bar. On the other hand, Evans was hoping to make an insane plea and had just about managed to secure an attorney after almost everyone had turned him down. He had already been examined by two doctors from the Concord Insane Asylum a week prior, both of whom were in the court to give their findings. A jury was selected from a 100 men, with everything assembled smoothly, allowing the first day's proceedings to kick off. That afternoon saw testimony from Mr Day and Mrs Lovering, James Pinder, who found the comb, and Sheriff Drew, amongst others. In general, it was a straight retelling of the case with few revelations, except from Sheriff Drew, who told the court that he had never promised freedom and safety for Evans if he confessed, only if Georgie was returned safe from harm. The second day was only slightly more dramatic, when Drew was recalled and produced Evans's knife, taken from him upon his arrest. 
which he told the court had been sharpened by a blacksmith just a few days before Georgie's murder. The start of the third and final day of the trial was delayed after Evans was discovered making a suicide attempt by hanging himself with his suspenders in the town hall cell prior to the court's opening. A court minder had found him in time to lower and free him from the makeshift noose, though several of the journalists present at the trial were openly suspicious that the effort was less a serious attempt at his own life and more a desperate move to help bolster his insanity plea, which, based on the evidence of the doctors later that day, was patently weak for Evans. Lasting just under half an hour, the defence made a half-hearted plea, which comfortably set up the asylum doctors to refute the claims, telling the court that they found no evidence at all that Evans was suffering from any form of insanity. The judge's summary was brief in the extreme, and the jury were out of the courtroom making their deliberations for only half an hour before returning a guilty verdict, sentencing Evans to execution by hanging in February of the following year in order to comply with the New Hampshire law of delaying all executions for a full year after their trial. Following the trial, the press were quick to publish conversations that they had been holding back on official orders held between Sheriff Drew and Evans during his incarceration, implicating him in a host of other murders. According to various testimonies, Evans, who the papers were now calling an insane man or the devil incarnate, had confessed to the murder of a five-year-old girl in Derry in 1858. He had taken her out to the woods, strangled her and tore off her clothing, only to discover that she had a deformity of her spine and thus dumped her body unmolested near an old tree stump. Three years later, he had kidnapped, assaulted and slit the throat of a 14-year-old girl named Anna Sibley in Maine, and then, four years later, he killed both the Joyce children in Bussey's Woods. Seven years after that, shortly before the murder of Georgie, he was alleged to have raped and murdered a woman in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, whose body had been unearthed in a patch of woodland just weeks before his arrival at his in-law's home in Northwood. Understandably, the tone in the press was one of damnation, with one wrapping up their piece on the confessions by stating, If there is a hell of burning fire and brimstone, we should make no particular objection to him going there immediately. However, whilst the press was having a field day printing these confessions of Evans, the truth of the matter was somewhat different. Evans had alluded to some of the murders in conversations, whilst others were just unsolved crimes that were being linked to Evans on fairly precarious rumours. And far from giving clear confessions, Evans was still professing to be entirely innocent, seemingly hoping that he may be pardoned before his execution could be carried out. If this was his desire, then it was one of little hope. The public opinion was firmly against Evans, who was seen as nothing short of a monster. Finally, in the days running up to his hanging, Evans gave a confession to the chaplain of the prison, asking for it to be held back from being published until after his death. The morning of the 17th of February was cool and clear. Evans had spent the night sleeping peacefully in the company of Reverend Church, the son-in-law of the prison chaplain. He rose at 5am and spent the last few hours of the morning before he was to be taken to the gallows praying. The execution was to be a quiet affair with only 12 officials in attendance, though a large crowd had gathered outside the prison walls. His wife and son visited him at 8am, allowing Evans to explain that he had arranged to sell his body to the highest bidder, in this case a doctor named Crosby who had paid $50 for the pleasure, and that this money should be left to his son. He then was led out to the gallows. At 11 o'clock, Evans was led out through the guard room to the scaffold by Warden Pillsbury and delivered to the sheriffs. He was dressed in a suit of black and seemed quite calm and self-possessed. A slight trembling of his knees was the only visible sign of emotion. Whilst his arms and legs were being pinioned, his lips were seen to move and it's said that he remarked that he did not see the use of it. Sheriff Odlin then read the death warrant and at six minutes past eleven o'clock placed his foot upon the spring of the drop and Evans was launched into eternity. His body hung for 19 minutes before the doctors pronounced him dead, and he was carted off to Dartmouth Medical College, where he was dissected and preserved for the future use of the students. The day after the execution, Evans's long, wordy confessions were printed in full in newspapers across America. In them, 
he confessed to killing Georgie Lovering, as well as the five-year-old girl from Derry, along with several thefts and acts of counterfeiting and fraud. He did, however, maintain that he was innocent of the other murders that he had been linked with, including those of the Joyce children. In general, the confessions were full of bitterness, victim-blaming and crass arrogance. His reasons for killing Georgie were to put her out of the way, as she had seen him counterfeiting a dollar bill and had threatened him by suggesting that she would report him to the police. Georgie, he said, had made sexual advances towards him on several occasions, a few times upon which he complied, though he claimed he more frequently refused. Shortly after, Georgie threatened reporting him to the police for rape, and so he deemed it necessary to murder her, as he had found himself completely in her power. Perhaps more disturbing, and probably a lot more true of his mind, were his secondary reasons for the crime, stating that he did it to gain some knowledge of the human system that might be of use to him as a doctor. Similarly, the murder of the five-year-old girl he said he did in order to procure a body to examine for surgical purposes. It's clear that Franklin B. Evans was a brutal murderer, a degenerate who absolutely could have carried out horrific murders of the Joyce children in Bussey's Woods during the summer of 1865. But did he? As far as the press and the public were concerned at the time, he was perfectly guilty and his confessions were good enough to call the case solved. There has been precious little written about his life and crimes, but that which has been written has been keen to tie him to every murder he was linked to after his execution, despite the fact that these confessions he was said to have given to Sheriff Drew were vague in the extreme and full of information that was readily available to the public. Perhaps we are forced instead to deal with the uncomfortable truth that the murder of the Joyce children was an unsolved case, with a murderer who managed to escape detection, sticking his head above the ground for a moment of heinous violence and then slinking off back into the shadows. In the very least, I think most can agree that Henry Johnston Brent's ghost encounter had very little to do with anything, though it does seem he got his wish. For perhaps longer than he could have ever dreamed, his pamphlet forced the case into the public eye. Being one of the only contemporary long-form documents that still survives on the case, it continues to shine a light upon the event that would otherwise lay long since forgotten. So that was The Murders of Franklin B. Evans. And don't forget the Bussies Wood ghost mystery. We'll talk a little bit about that because there's a fair bit to talk about after these short advert breaks. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. The ad read today says that I should talk about a time when I felt uncertain about where I was going in life or what the right path was and how I got through it. But since this is an advert and not an hour-long podcast... I think I'll skip that because that was basically my entire 20s and the first half of my 30s. Sometimes in life we are going to be faced with tough choices and the path forward is not always going to be clear. Whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. I've used BetterHelp. When I first started up this sponsorship, I I used it for a few months just to get the hang of it and see what it's like before I started talking about it and advertising it, right? And I found it really, really enjoyable experience, really beneficial experience. I didn't really have anything that I needed to go and see a therapist about at the time. I mean, trust me, I've had serious anxiety issues. I mean, I still have serious anxiety issues. But when I went to speak to BetterHelp, I, 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 I sort of gave them more of a vague sort of, hey, you know, um, these things in life get me down and this I struggle with this and a bit of that. And, and I just sort of found it really useful to just talk about these things, like the, the smaller things in life that were sort of dragging me back a little bit. Um, and, and, yeah, I found it really beneficial. Um, if you are uh, thinking of starting therapy or you've ever thought that you might benefit from it, it, I definitely would say, and I, and I know this is obviously a sponsorship, but I definitely would say to give BetterHelp a try. For me, I found that the, the, the biggest benefits were that it was um, flexible and online because, uh, you know, with anxiety, uh, I, I, don't, I know everyone's different. For me particularly, I, I found I find it difficult to go to a new place. Like, like so if I was going to do therapy in, in person, I find it difficult to go to a, 
a, an office and and meet a therapist that 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 was for me is like the struggle right so doing it online is so much easier and so much uh more of a positive easy experience i mean i i genuinely did it in in my pajamas quite a few times <laughs> you know stumbled out of bed stuck a jumper on and pretended to be awake and did my therapy in the morning so you know i, I found it really good it, it helped me to just clear through a few issues that i'd had you know and that's basically what it's designed to be it's designed to be convenient flexible and and to suit you uh you just fill out a brief questionnaire you get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for for no additional charge i um was happy with my therapist so i didn't try that but yeah apparently you swap at any time no additional charge so yeah if you are interested in therapy or you are so I say struggling uh making sort of some tough choices not really sure of sort of like the decisions you need to make in the path ahead and your life's maybe a bit cluttered or confused and you're not really sure where you're going let a therapy be your map with better help visit betterhelp.com slash dark histories today to get 10 percent off your first month that's better help h-e-l-p dot com slash dark histories welcome back so that was the story of well there's two stories really because first of all we had the i suppose it was kind of almost three stories in one the joyce children murders then you have henry's ghost and then you have the Franklin B. Evans murders. So let's sort of talk about them separating the ghosts and the murders. So first of all, I really think Henry's uh, book is really interesting. He sounds like, when you read his book, he actually sounds like a really um, like rational, interesting man. Uh, it says he's, he, that he isn't interested in spiritualism. Or not that he's not interested in spiritualism, but that he isn't a spiritualist. He says that he's not uh, 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 overtly religious. And he questions what he saw constantly in the pamphlet that he wrote and i think that the reason he wrote the pamphlet was actually that it was a genuine sight in that, that that genuinely puzzled him and quite interested him it piqued his curiosity as, as to what he had seen on that night however on the other hand having now just said all that he seems to point out in this pamphlet that his main goal for the pamphlet was to keep the case in the public eye and the pressure on the police uh, to get on with the investigation uh, by by sort of keeping it in the public eye. And he, he alludes to the fact that the, the, the sort of ghost story might be enough to sort of keep it in the public eye and, 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 and as I say, keep that pressure on. So I, I wonder if he, he wrote it entirely aware that it was all a nonsense and that he hadn't really seen the ghost in it. He made it all up, but that he really wanted to... Um, just sort of say like like keep the case in the public eye because he lived right near the area and he seemed to take it quite personally. Obviously, the the the, mur- the, the, the murders of the children were brutal and, and I think that affected a lot of people who live locally. It was a it was a big deal at the time, and, and I think it affected him similarly. But I also think, he, like I say, I think he took it quite personally because he he spent most of his time uh, like spare time painting in the woods. He painted the landscapes in the woods and and. You can tell by the way that he he writes about the woods in the book that he loved this place. He, he it was, you know, for him it was a a, a real sanctuary. Uh, a, a, and I, and I think the fact that the children were murdered there and sort of turned this sanctuary into like quite a nightmarish place to to be. I think he took that quite personally, and I and I think that he really just genuinely wrote this pamphlet because he wanted to see the 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 crime solved. Was it a real ghost sighting or not? He does write about it very well. Um, I really enjoy his the way he uh, speaks about it, uh, the way he's so rational. And, and he's obviously quite sensational in his language and stuff, and he does write very poetically. But at, this, but at the same time, he does seem very down to earth. In a lot of older sort of ghost stories, you're always constantly having to pick apart the the motive. And, 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 and generally speaking, they're usually religious or philosophically sort of motivated but with him i really don't think that's the case um so it's interesting was it a real ghost sighting or not i think possibly not i think he made it up uh, like i say for all those reasons just mentioned but if it was i think he's actually quite believable that's that's the funny thing is is it's actually quite believable because of the way he writes about it so anyway that's sort of that because it's it's sort of less thing it is interesting it's an interesting sort of side to the story and that's obviously why i included it but I suppose the bigger mystery here is is who killed the Joyce children, right? Was it Evans? Now, 
not much has been written about this case. In fact, I would say almost none. Um, there's no books about it. There's nothing. It's like if, if you want to read anything, it's almost all contemporary. There's a few sort of like bits and pieces here and there that, that are modern, but but not so much. But everyone that has written about this case uh, just sort of goes along with the original story, which was that Evans confessed to killing all of these people. Now, I don't think he did. And I think that there's a modern obsession with wanting to tie the term serial killer to people. And the fact that I think in true crime, the idea of serial killers uh, tend to be like a modern uh, phenomena, which is not true. You know, f- serial killers have been around for centuries. But there's there's a thing in true crime of like finding that the first serial killer, right? Uh, and and talking about people as ah oh, one of the first serial killers, one of the earliest serial killers, H. H. Holmes, you know, one of America's first serial killers. Uh, uh, well, this guy predates H. H. Holmes, and so everyone that's and so everyone that's written about the case seems to want to pin that moniker onto him and say, oh, he was the earliest serial killer, and I guess it's to give it an added sort of bit of sensation because of you know of the obsession with serial killers, but. But I think that's mad because this story, it doesn't need any extra sensation. It's absolutely brutal in the extreme. You know, I, I'll be honest, I cut, oh, I didn't cut things out and I explained everything that needed to be explained. But but when you read this stuff in the contemporary accounts, some of it's brutal and I, I didn't quote it because it was just so brutal. So this was a, a savagely brutal case. So it doesn't need the sensation of calling him a serial killer. The reason I think this and, and is when you look at the actual case of it, when Evans, the reason they think there was the Joyce murders, right, is because they say that he had a conversation with Evans, with um, with Drew, sorry, with Sheriff Drew, and that this conversation was essentially a confession. Well, that wasn't the case, right? What happened? Two men showed up uh, to look at his, uh, look at him in the prison cell sort of tourist people uh, like locals or, or people would come and visit the prison cell from far away even just to check out what the murderer looked like right and these two men were were basically that they were just coming to like Ogo uh, uh, Evans and, and then leave and Evans was said to have been really really nervous the whole time he was put in the cell he had this like uh, like every day he sort of seemed to grow more anxious and of a nervous disposition and it's when they left uh he said, "Like, oh, were they from Boston?" Uh, which Drew said, "No, they weren't." And he was, sh- and and he was sure that they were police from Boston uh, investigating the Joyce murders. And this is what puts Drew onto the line of thought that maybe Evans was the murderer. And so he basically said to him, "Like, were you the murderer?" And but Evans never says, "Yes, I was the murderer." What he actually says is, "I was there at the time." And they'll hang me for it. Which makes me think that he was less concerned about actually being the killer and then getting caught. And more concerned about just getting stitched up for a murder that had no murderer yet. And so they could tie the murderer onto him and be done with it. I think that's perfectly plausible. I think, you know, given that he was very nervous and very paranoid and and panicking, I think it's totally plausible that he could have thought hey, there's these two people, maybe they're police from Boston. Oh my God, they're going to arrest me for the, murder of, for the murder of the Jewish children and I'm going to get hanged for it. You know, like you can totally see those steps. And Evans pushes him, right, and, and says like he wants more detail. But the detail that he actually gives is, is not all that great. He described the house where they lived. But I know I could describe you the house where they lived because I read the newspapers as well. And the house was described and I obviously like I went and found it on Google Street View because the house is still standing but if he'd been in the area at the time of the murders around about give or take like a few weeks of the murders or or maybe at the exact time he absolutely would have heard all about it because this was huge news and he doesn't say anything that wasn't news so basically he says in this conversation he has with Evans he basically says that the boy and the girl were stabbed to death, that the girl was raped uh, when she was killed and, and that they uh, lived in a brick townhouse and describes whereabouts it was. But 
that's all information that he, if he was in in the area at the time, he he definitely would have read about in the newspapers. So I don't think that to me is that that to me is not enough for a confession. If, if he I, was being tried for that case and I was on the jury, I would not say that's enough evidence to like to c- condemn him to an execution. Absolutely not. I think absolutely he was a horrible man, and his confessions are, are just maddening to to read because it, you, he's just a disgusting human and obviously we knew that he's a pretty bad person before because of his crimes but then you read his confessions and they're, they're, it's just they're just disgusting and you know his crimes were absolutely degenerate he totally could have killed the joyce children because their murders were, were pretty brutal to, to say the least so i i don't doubt that he could have done it and I think, you know, that him being in the area at the time does sort of raise a few questions. But my one reason as to think that why he didn't do it is that he never confessed to it and he confessed to everything else. He didn't com- He confessed to the Georgie Lovering murder. He confessed to the murder of the five-year-old girl. And then he confessed to a massive string of, like, other crimes that no one was even asking him about. And to me, that shows that he was terrified of dying and he really wanted to confess everything uh to sort of hope for redemption some form of redemption after death he had no reason at all to say that he was innocent of the um joyce murders and the the other murders um you know if if he wasn't he, he had no reason to lie so for me i don't think he actually did it i think the contemporary reports pin him on it because they they sort of made very big a very big deal out of these confessions that in my eyes weren't even real confessions and i think modern reports pin it on him because they really want him to be a serial killer because a serial killer is a more interesting story because you know it's got that badge and and i think that's it uh despite the fact that you know he's not famous anyway no one's ever written about him uh and you know the murders like i say are absolutely are brutal you don't need any more sensationalism but i guess that's a true crime genre isn't it it wants serial killers because that's what sells i guess um so yeah that's why i think they pin it on him because i don't think i think if you read the case i think if you read into the case i I don't think you can come to any other conclusion i don't think he did it um i do think he obviously killed georgie and the five-year-old and i absolutely am thrilled to the pieces that he was executed for his crimes because he was a revolting human but yeah, I don't, I don't think he did the other crimes. So anyway, that's my thoughts on the matter. If you disagree, uh, feel free to get in touch. Uh, contact at darkhistories.com is my email address. Uh, you can go to darkhistories.com website and you can find all the ways that you can contact me there. Uh, also, all of that's in the show notes as well, including all of the um, uh, social media. Oh, we've got threads now. That's exciting, uh, I suppose. I'm not very much of a social media guy, but I've got it. So, yeah, you can find it all over social media. All the links say darkissues.com or in the show notes. You can also find all the ways you can support. I've got a patron, um, which, you know, if, you, if you're up for supporting that, then that's brilliant. There's also all the you know, the merch and the books and stuff like that. Anyway, all of that's on the website, darkissues.com or in the show notes. Whew, that's enough of jammering on about that. Thanks very much for listening. It's been a real pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a pretty dark one this week, actually. It's funny because the show started as Dark Histories and it was always, you know, focusing on dark stuff. But for a while, I feel like I've kind of moved away from that and gone more just to sort of like fringy elements of history, you know, like that I find interesting. Um, And obviously a lot of it is still quite dark, but I haven't really sort of dug into a real sort of savagely dark crime. and, And I feel like this was one... So I hope you enjoyed it and you found it an an interesting enough story. Um, So, yeah, thanks very much for listening. I'll speak to you real soon. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with the next episode. Until then, take care. Sleep tight.